Your Federal Reserve System, they, their eyes glaze over and they think, I have no idea what this thing is. I'm never going to understand how it works. This is too complicated. I better just let the experts deal with this. Well, there's your mistake. The so-called experts have no freaking idea what they're doing. And I don't care if you're on the left or the right. That should be obvious. Now, I'll have more to say about particular member, particular uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve System as time goes on tonight. But let me say a little bit, though, about Alan Greenspan, who bears great responsibility for the current crisis. And yet here's Greenspan, who just a few months ago made this, gave this inane speech in which he said, you know, I, I guess there's a flaw in the free market that I never noticed before. You know, I just, I wonder what that, you know, how could I not have seen this flaw? Yeah, Alan, I'll help you find the flaw. Why don't you look in the mirror? Maybe it'll be looking right back at you. There's the flaw. How about the idea that we, it's, it's a desirable thing to have a Soviet commissar in charge of interest rates and money? Maybe that might have a little bit to do with what happened to us. And that has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the free market. Some of you may remember years ago, the New Republic magazine had a journalist named Stephen Glass who got in trouble because he wrote such fascinating stories, and it turns out the reason no other reporter had gotten any of these stories was that Stephen Glass made them up. <laughs> so, so one story he told, for example, was about a young, like, 14-year-old computer hacker who was such a good computer hacker that corporate uh, representatives would come to him proactively and say, look, 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 please don't hack our, our site. So in, in return for that, here's a new car. You know, the kid can't even drive. You know, give him a new car. You know, here's a boat, whatever. He made the story up. There's actually a great movie about this called Shattered Glass. I, I recommend it. Well, anyway, Stephen Glass wrote a story in the late 1990s about some Wall Street investment gurus who had built a little shrine to Alan Greenspan. They put a picture of Greenspan. They had some candles around it. And they would gather there and meditate together. Now, okay, so he made that story up, but isn't it kind of odd that nobody noticed that at the time? Nobody said, wait a minute, nobody could possibly have a shrine to Alan Greenspan. Why did that story go by without comment? Because it seemed to be so true. Everybody thought Alan Greenspan is like a god among men. I mean, he's this brilliant genius. He's the maestro. So, of course, sure, the idea that somebody might wave incense in front of his sacred image didn't seem totally implausible. <laughs> Well, Greenspan is responsible, uh, more than any one individual, I would say, if we're going to try to pinpoint individuals, I think there are systemic reasons for the crisis, but individuals, Alan is way, way up there, way, way up there. So what I want to do tonight is tell you a little bit about this, so sort of defend this statement, and I want to tell you about a gentleman who won the Nobel Prize in Economics. No, not that guy. I'm talking about the gentleman who won in 1974. F.A. Hayek. Now, Hayek was a great genius. I mean, not only was he a brilliant economist, if you actually read his writings on economics in the 1930s, you realize immediately that you are in the presence of a great genius. But he could write on history, he could write on philosophy, to impress people who were experts in those disciplines. A great genius indeed. Well, what Hayek won the Nobel Prize for was for explaining why it is that the economy moves in a boom-bust cycle. Everybody's doing great, then everybody's in the toilet. Then everybody's doing great. Then... Why is that, he wants to know. And he's not satisfied with the conventional answer that, well, that's just the way the free market is. You know, we just have to live with it. That's just how markets are. It's always been that way, up and down, up and down. So this is just such not an explanation. This is a name non-explanation. Or the, or the psychological claim that, well, you know, the, the investment world is moved by animal spirits, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a psychological disposition so that investors sometimes just become, un, they become pessimistic to an unwarranted degree, we need to get them more optimistic. You know, if, if real, genuine, if real imbalances in the economy could be corrected simply by changing the psychological states of mind of investors, why don't we devote all our research money to a happy drug for investors, right? Not so we'd never have the boom bus cycle. Now, Hayek wants to find real rather than psychological explanations for what's going on. And I don't mean uh, 
that psychological explanations for things aren't real. I mean real in the sense that they involve resources, they involve structural issues. So Hayek's theory proceeds as follows. It begins with a question. Why is it that when we, when we experience a bus like we're seeing now, what we are seeing is a massive cluster of error? That's a term that the British economist Lionel Robbins used in his book, The Great Depression, in 1934. There's a cluster of error, by which he means all of a sudden we're seeing retail stores and, and some even longer term, higher order investments like uh, mining, or manufacturing, whatever. We're seeing it's losses being made on a massive scale in all different sectors of the economy. Now, it's not that everybody is, is making losses, but a very substantial portion of market actors are suffering losses. And he wants to know, why should that all happen in a clump like this? Especially when you consider that the market has a natural way to weed out people who are bad at forecasting consumer demand. If you're bad at this, you make losses. If you're really bad at it, you go out of business. And your capital is then transferred to people who are better at forecasting consumer demand. So in other words, those who are in the private sector, who are private actors, are in effect in an election every day. And we cast the votes with our dollar bills. They're in an election every day. And so those who keep getting elected, because they're adding value to the inputs they're putting into their production processes, they get command of more capital. So these are people who are making good decisions. So why should people who are selected by the market to be good forecasters suddenly make dreadful forecasts that are all wrong in the same direction simultaneously? Isn't that at least you know, worth wondering about? So Hyde wants to answer that question. And he gives an answer that, as you'll see, exonerates the free market and shows that there's something else at work here than mere private actors engaging in voluntary exchange. There's another actor on the scene that is introducing discoordination throughout the system, and that's the central bank. Hayek's theory goes as follows. Now, follow me on this. There is no one on Earth who cannot understand this theory. There are a few exceptions who also happen to be Nobel Prize winners, but there's nobody in this room who can't understand this. That was a cheap one. That was, that, was a, that, was just for, that was just the red meat for, for those of you. Um, he says, now, interest rates. Now, follow me. You think interest rates, oh, I knew the technical part was coming. No, I'm telling you, this is not hard. Interest rates can come down in two different ways. The first and healthy way they can come down is that you and I save more. Now, it's not difficult to understand why that leads to lower interest rates. If we save more, then the banks have more on hand to lend so, to make a long story very short, the price of lending goes down. They have more to lend with. So, just like the supply of anything goes up, the price tends to go down. Okay, so that's how interest rates can come down naturally. Now, this is an essential point to understand. Because here we see how the interest rate performs, and when I say the interest rate, I'm really speaking of a whole structure of interest rates. There isn't any one interest rate in the economy. If you go to get a loan, you're going to find different people get different interest rates. We're, we're talking really about a structure of interest rates, but for shorthand, I may slip into saying the interest rate. Now, interest rates perform an essential coordinating function in the economy. They're not just arbitrary numbers that can just be fiddled with. They perform an essential coordinating function. The first function they perform, and, they, and both of these functions involve coordinating production across time. The first function is they, in effect, make clear that consumers are deferring consumption for the time being. That is to say, although consumers continue to consume, they're not consuming everything that they've earned, everything that they have a right to. In other words, I work for some factory, I make $100. Well, that $100 bill entitles me to go back into the economy and claim $100 worth of stuff. But if I save, I put 40 in the bank, and I consume only $60 worth, I've saved. The remainder. And this has two important results, and both of which are healthy and coordinated. The first is, businesses engage in long-term production when interest rates become low. Obviously. Because then their projects are cheaper. And the longer term their project is, let's say it's, it's a 10-year project, it's not going to start churning out products or turning a profit for 10 years. 
a slight reduction in the interest